church. It's such a good uh, gift to be together. We are in the book of John. We are walking through John through the framework of this idea that Jesus is among us. Uh, Jesus is among us through the gospel of John, through the story that is there, through the light that we get to see in the midst of the darkness. But Jesus is not only among us through the text, through the word, through the verbo, as Pastor Inez walked us through just a few short weeks ago, but Jesus is also among us here and now. Uh, that's what Anthony was communicating. Uh, that's what Pastor Inez was communicating. That's what Mary was sharing as she shared her story of stepping into that space and recognizing in the face of her AAPI sisters and brothers, Jesus is here with us as well. Uh, Jesus is among us now, church. And so as we get to walk in the word this morning, would you have your eyes open to see Jesus among us here and now? Would you have your ears open to hear Jesus among us? And maybe I need to even say it a little bit more personally. Would you, would you have your eyes open to see Jesus among you? Would you have your ears open to hear Jesus among you right now? That God would have a living word, uh, a living verbo that would move into your life. So let us begin. We began in John 1 and, and Pastor Inez walked us through this idea of Jesus, the living word and the verbo and that moves us, that Jesus moves, that it's not just this static idea, but it's this movement of God in and through our lives. And then we picked up the witness of John the Baptist, John the testifier, the one who has seen and testifies, the one who's on the lookout, the one who holds back the ancient story of Isaiah and goes, wait, there were these prophecies and promises from long ago, and, and God's picking them up and doing a new thing with them now. In fact, the Messiah that I've been hoping for, he's right there. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is present. He is near. And Jesus begins to pick up disciples. And that same thing that Mary invited people to say, just, hey, come and see. Come and be. That is Jesus. That's, that's Jesus' language. Mary is using Jesus' language. Just come and see, come and be. That's what Jesus is inviting his disciples. And just as Jesus has this invitational come and see, come and be, so he gets a wedding invitation to show up at a wedding in Cana. Jesus is loved so much in his local community that people said, we're having a party and we want that one to be there. We want Jesus to be at our wedding, not even knowing what Jesus would bring to the wedding. So Jesus shows up at the wedding. They don't drink all the wine. They had a good time. There was music, there was dancing, there was partying, there were festivities and food. And then his mama said, hey, the party needs to get turned up just a little bit. We need to dial this thing to 11. We are not quite there yet. And so, hey, son, you need to fill up these empty jars and get the fine wine going. Now, Jesus, he doesn't talk back to his mom just a little bit. He's like, now, how do you know it's my time? And she said, son of God, I birthed you. I know a little thing about labor pains and time. I know the contractions of the coming kingdom. I know when it's time to birth the kingdom of God among us. And so he says, yes, ma'am. And he tells the servants to go fill up the jars. They fill up the jars. They bring back. It's the finest wine anyone has ever tasted. And it says just then and there, the disciples believed. They saw something. They saw something miraculous. And everyone that day left with a miracle and the next morning had a holy hangover in Jesus' name because the Son of God showed up on the scene and did the miraculous. We move right then from there to Jesus stepping into Jerusalem, clearing the temple courts and beginning to say, hey, this is the Father's house and you are desecrating and dishonoring the Father's house. What are you doing? Realizing that there is this beauty of holiness in the house of God and that this is not a place to dishonor God. This is not a place to use God for your own profit, for your own purposes, but to give God holiness and honor. And then as we move from that physicality of the house of God, today we'll move into the house of God within our own beings, within our own bodies. We turn to John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, in a story of a man named Nicodemus. It says, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. So one of the religious leaders, one of the religious elite at the time. He came to Jesus at night. I don't want you to miss that little line, that at night piece, that he is coming in the shroud of darkness. But even the darkness is as light to Jesus. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. 
So we know that God is with you, but we don't know what else. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So he says, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And what is the kingdom of God? It's the manifestation, the realization of the goodness of the good news. It is shalom and wholeness and peace and justice and righteousness and just love pouring out into real relationships, real systems, real hope for real people. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Well, how can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. I love that he has this even childlike understanding. I don't even know what you're talking about, Jesus, but let me just go back to square one. Is this what you're talking about? Because surely that's not possible. And here's Jesus' response. This is where we'll land today in the text. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. This morning, what I feel compelled to share with us, church, is this holistic understanding, almost a reimagining of a redemptive framework of our flesh and of our spirit that so often have been separated and divided one from another. And what Jesus is doing is putting them together. He is saying there needs to be a birth of flesh alongside a birth of spirit. Not a birth of spirit that does away with birth of flesh, but one that begins to put these two things together. Nicodemus, if you want to see the kingdom of God, if you want to be in the kingdom of God, you need these two pieces. You need this birth of flesh in your life and this birth of spirit. When I think of flesh, and surely what Nicodemus would have potentially heard in flesh as well, boundaries, barriers, separators, one from another. Flesh being easily defiled, often considered unholy. We have this framework of flesh even in our Christian religion today, and we get some of that from the language that the Apostle Paul uses in the New Testament to try to warn us against sin and the sinful desires, but that's only one framework of flesh. It's not the whole story of flesh. There's so much more to say about flesh than to just be careful with flesh. In fact, I feel like the story of being careful with our flesh is the only story. It's, it's been the story that's been major. There hasn't even been a minor of goodness in my experience uh, so often with the church and so often with religion. And so today what I want to do is I want to kind of put some flesh back on flesh. I want to see a redeemed imagination for us to hold on to our flesh. But to begin with, I want us to recognize the ways in which flesh has been desecrated, in which flesh has been distorted. What are the ways in which our faith and our religion have desecrated our understanding of flesh, our very beings, our bodies? What are the ways that our culture has distorted our understanding of flesh? How has religion in your life, perhaps not just in some big broad scope, but maybe even personally, how has the religious institution, the system or a sermon or a leader or a mentor or a family member or a friend or a passage that was just weaponized out of context, how has that desecrated, de-holied flesh for you? Or how has culture distorted flesh? And again, both on some big broad level, but also on a really personal level. A lifetime of movies and TV and ads and music videos and magazines and living in LA where if you're going on a hike, someone is taking a selfie without much clothing on along the way at some point that you're just not quite sure you'll ever measure up to that person. Um, how has our culture, our surrounding world distorted our own personal understanding of flesh? And so today what I want us to do is I want us to sit with these realities. And I want us to begin to name uh, where we are in that journey and the lies that we have been told about flesh. Sit with these lies so that we can uphold the truth. Flesh gives birth to flesh is what Jesus tells Nicodemus. But what are the lies that we've been told about our flesh? We've been told lies that our flesh is impure, that our flesh does not possess the purity that is necessary to truly be good and holy and honorable. 
Or perhaps we've been told that we're overly pure, that we're so pure that we're prude, so prude that we're proud. Perhaps as you sit with the lies that you've been told about your flesh, you've been told that you're too old. That all of those stories that you hold in your body, that you don't have a place at the table. You have aged out of the story. You have aged out of the system. You don't have a place here at the table. Or you're too young. You need to grow up. Hey, millennials, stop with the side part when you get older and you start doing your hair how everybody else is supposed to. Then you can show up and be at present at the table. But not until then. Not until we consider that you're old enough to actually have a place here. Or you're too dark that the white supremacy system that we have all been bathed into has made this distinction not only apart from your own race and ethnicity, but even within the colorism that has permeated and perpetuated even within racial and ethnic groups, that even within the comfort and confines of your own race, you're considered too dark or you're considered not dark enough that you don't quite measure up. You're not fully one of us because you're not fully this or you're too much that, or perhaps you find yourself in between different racial and ethnic groups. You are somewhere in that in-between liminal space and you're never not sure if you're really gonna fully measure up. Perhaps your understanding of flesh is that you're too big. When you walk by a mirror, you just wanna walk by as quickly as possible. You don't wanna try on clothes because your understanding of your body is that it's not the right size or you're too small. That's not what a man is supposed to look like. That's not what a woman is supposed to look like. Where are you from? That as soon as somebody sees your flesh, this is the question that comes to their mind and that comes out of their lips. Where are you from? And you say, oh, I'm, I'm from Burbank. And they say, no, no, no. But where are you from? Burbank. I, I, was, I was born in Burbank. <laughs> but you realize that that's not really the question you're asking because just the implication of the visibility of your flesh, flesh that often feels invisible, promotes this question to stir up in somebody in a way that you don't see it happen for other people. Or perhaps it's this, go back to where you belong. That when somebody sees your flesh, this is the question that either comes out or the question that sits in your spirit and you're not quite sure, do I really belong here? Do I have a place here? Perhaps you consider yourself damaged goods. That somewhere along the way, somewhere along the line, that your story, your body, your experience, you feel like it can't be back, put back together. Or that you'll never measure up. That you'll never be quite enough. That you're sinful and beyond redemption. That what happened, what took place, what you did or what someone did to you, that God could never fully heal that. That there's not a redemptive story possible with your flesh. Perhaps it's that you're too fragile, you're too sensitive, you're too weak, that you really just need to let your skin thicken up just a little bit, or that you're too hardened, you're too callous, that people can't quite seem to get to the tenderness of your heart, and you're not quite sure you want to let anybody in because you've been hurt before by doing that. Or your flesh just inspires this question in people, why are you so angry? Just the rage, just the physicality, just the tensing up of your very flesh inspires this question from people, what is it about your anger? Or we don't speak that here. Or we don't speak like that here. We don't use that tone here. We don't use that accent here. We don't use that language here. We don't use that dialect here. That your very flesh, your very being, your very body, your very voice, the way that you hope and dream and pray and speak, that even that, you're too masculine, you're too feminine, you're not masculine enough, you're not feminine enough, you're unattractive, or your beauty is seen as a threat. That all of these are stories that we have been told about our flesh, that all of these are stories that we've been told about our bodies since before we could even think, since before we could even imagine. These are the pieces that have just been coming inside of our brain and we realize some of these without even being able to name them, without even being able to put them on a screen, that they're just there, they're just present. They're the water that we're swimming in, that we're bathed in, that we're soaking in. It's the blood running through our veins, but there is another story, church. There's a story that we need to hold today and it's that these are lies, 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 lies. They are all lies. This is not the truth of our flesh. This is not the truth of our bodies. This is not the truth of our very beings. This truth of the matter is that the slate has been wiped clean in Jesus Christ. 
These never were supposed to be the first word, the last word, or the loudest word about our flesh, our beings, or our bodies. There is a truer word that we are to walk in, and today Jesus is speaking that word to us through a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. And what does he say to him? He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Did you hear it? Flesh gives birth to flesh. So if flesh gives birth to flesh, what does that tell us about flesh? It tells us we can cancel out some lies and begin to hold on to some truths. If flesh gives birth to flesh, then flesh is life-giving. It's able to birth. It's able to give life. Flesh is life-giving. Flesh is generative. It has the potential to make things come alive. It has the potential to make things grow. It has the potential to make things be just by our very flesh. It is creative. We'll get to see such a beautiful expression of this tonight in our celebration of Black History Month with our Arts Night tonight that our dear sister Jasmine White is curating and hosting for us this evening. I hope you get to see the creative expression of Black bodies and the beauty and the excellence and the vulnerability and the courage and the joy that we'll get to sit in tonight as a church to see beautiful body and flesh and heart, life-giving, generative, creative flesh coming alive and expressing the goodness of God and worship. Flesh is innovative. Flesh can make things happen. Flesh can get things done. Flesh can show up in a kitchen when there's not enough food on the table and all of a sudden have a feast for people. Flesh is good. God sees and says the flesh, the body, the being is good and not just good, but very good. God sees and says to his creation in Genesis 1, this is mine, my beloved, my son, my daughter, and you are not just good, you are my prized creation. You are very good, so good that you are holy. Your body is a holy temple holding the very presence of God within you. And that is beautiful. You are God's poema, God's masterpiece. You are very being, you are very flesh, the way God made you exactly as you are, just a little bit different than the person next to you on purpose so that you would be set apart, so that you would be distinct, so that God could say, oh, I made that one just like this because only you could look like that, only you could embody that. And thus, you get to be made in the image of God. We all get to be made in the image of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, flesh is life-giving, generative, creative, innovative, good, very good, holy, beautiful, and made in the image of God. These are the truths about our beings. These are the truths about our bodies that we get to walk in. Nicodemus gets this framework of understanding of the kingdom of God that our very bodies are meant for good. The flesh gives birth to flesh. And so what does that mean for us, church? What does that mean if flesh gives birth to flesh? And if we are made in the image of God, it means that we get to walk in tandem with Jesus. If flesh was good enough for God, it's good enough for us. We began the story in John 1. It says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and full of truth. Jesus put on skin. Jesus put on a body. And so often we get this framework of flesh in our bodies and we separate it from our spirits and our souls. And then on the cosmic level, we do this with the world, that the world is somehow so scary and bad and God doesn't want anything to do with that. And instead, we're just going to set our eyes towards heaven and not focus on the world. But notice what happens here in John chapter 3. We get the, the verse that shows up on a poster board at Dodgers games, John 3, 16. And what does Jesus say about the world? It tells us that God so loved the world. God so loved our beings. God so loved our bodies. God so loved our flesh that he put on flesh and he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That this Jesus 
put on flesh to save the cosmic expression of flesh, the world, in and through the body of Christ. This is the truth. Is there a lie you need to let go of this week? Is there a lie in your being, in your body, in your very flesh that you need to release? Is there a truth that you need to hold to? And if there's a truth that you need to hold to, may the Holy Spirit be the one who speaks that truth because that's where the story goes next. Where the story goes next with Jesus is that he tells him, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. What I want us to hold this morning is the reality that flesh is good. It's not that Jesus is doing away with flesh. It's not that Jesus is saying the flesh is so bad that you have to have the spirit to kind of cover up the flesh. No, he's saying that if you want to see the kingdom of God, you see Jesus moving in and through and among you. But if you want to be in the kingdom of God, you need to be birthed by the Holy Spirit. We get to see the kingdom of God through Jesus, but we get to be a part of the kingdom of God through the Holy Spirit. And this birth is a total transformation of our entire being from the inside out. It's not a transformation that does away with flesh. It is a transformation that fully fulfills the fullness of our flesh in a new creation breath of the Holy Spirit within us. It is a there is more with the Spirit kind of word. It's not that the flesh is bad. It's just that God is going to do more. God is going to do grace on top of grace with the Spirit on top of our flesh. Yes, this is the flesh. It's the framework, but the breath of the Spirit puts new life within our flesh, puts a new creation kind of life within our flesh allows that flesh to live into the fullness that it was always meant to live into in the first place. Spirit giving birth to spirit is a there is more kind of word. In your story, in your life, in your body, in your being, it's a there is more more kind of word. As you go back through the book of John and you get to pick up the pieces along the way, he tells us in John chapter one that there was one named Moses who the law came through and it was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And the way that the writer frames this is that grace on top of grace brought Jesus on top of the law. The law was the framework, but grace on top of that grace, Jesus comes to fulfill with grace and truth through his very being. We go next to John the Baptist. John comes as a messenger of the Messiah, but by grace on top of grace, Jesus comes not as the messenger of the Messiah, but as the Messiah himself. We go next to the empty jars at the wedding, filled by human hands with water at the wedding in Cana, but by grace on top of grace, Jesus miraculously turns that water into to wine. It's a grace on top of grace already given kind of word. We get there with Nicodemus is told in the story, flesh gives birth to flesh, but by grace on top of grace, the Holy Spirit gives birth to a spirit within us. It's not that the law wasn't good enough. It's not that John the Baptist wasn't a messenger enough. It's not that water isn't life-giving enough. It's not that flesh isn't enough. It's that God is still growing grace among us and within us and before us and behind us and beyond us. God is grace going ahead of us. We just got to do our best to keep up with the grace that God is growing. God is still in the grace going and growing business. It's a there is more kind of word. What you are seeing with your own eyes is not the fullness of the story. There is a grace being built on top of the grace that has already been given in your life. The grace of your very flesh that God sees and says is creative and beautiful and life-giving and generative and innovative and holy and beautiful and made in the image of God by the breath of the Holy Spirit. God sees and says, I'm taking your very body and by my breath within, new life is going to come. 
And the aim is not just to give birth. The birth was the beginning of the new life. We're not stopping at the birth. The birth is to get that heartbeat going in a new way. And then the question is, what are you going to do with that heartbeat as it begins to pump that blood through your veins? And then you begin to live a new life in and through Jesus. There's a framework in the book of Ezekiel chapter 37. It's a framework of this idea of flesh and bones and spirit. And it's a word of the living God pouring out God's spirit in and through us and awakening the parts of us that have fallen asleep. Awakening the parts of us that have died. Awakening the parts of us that we thought would never be resuscitated. And this morning, I believe that God is in the resuscitation and resurrection business. This morning, I believe that God has breath for someone today to awaken dry bones. This morning, I've got to believe even through a screen that somebody is sitting here in the weakness of their body. Their spirit is willing, but their flesh is weak. And God says, come to me with your weak flesh and let my Holy Spirit blow through and give resuscitation and resurrection to your very being. As I prophesy and pray these words from Ezekiel 37 over you. Would you just hold open hands with your very good and beautiful body before God? Would you say, God, take this body of mine and by your spirit that gives birth to spirit, would you bring new life into me? God, I want to see the kingdom of God through my eyes, but I want to be a part of this kingdom of God through your Holy Spirit within me. This is the invitation that Jesus has. If you watch Nicodemus through the rest of this Gospel of John, you will see a trajectory by the power of the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus will not be the same man in chapter 7 and at the end of the book that he is in chapter 3. And may that be the same for our story as well. Somebody's in chapter three, but chapter seven's coming. May God move us even in this moment today. May I close this sermon as we head our way into communion by proclaiming Ezekiel 37 over us. The hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and he set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I was prophesying, there was a noise of rattling sounds and the bones, they began to came together bone to bone. And I looked and tendons and flesh, they appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. So he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath. Come, Holy Spirit, from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. And they came to life, and they stood up on their feet. A vast army, a beloved community, a church that we had hoped for, black and brown and Asian American and Pacific Islander and white and sisters and brothers and younger and older and those who've been hurt along the way and those who are finding redemption even today. And God breathes breath of a spirit upon you even now. Holy Spirit, come invade our homes. We open our doors and our windows to you. Would the four winds blow through our very lives right now? The temples that we have established, 
the places that we have set up as holy in our world, God, would you make residence in those places? Would you make residence in the places that we have created that we thought would give us happiness and joy? God, would you just enter into those and say, no, this is what you need instead. I am what you need instead. My Holy Spirit breathing new life is what you need instead. The spirit of truth speaking into the lies that we've held for so long, would we no longer hold that lie, but would we behold a truth? Would we hold a truth? Would we become a truth, God? For our tender flesh today, for the places where we're especially vulnerable and weak before you, God. In our weakness, would you be strong? Would you do a healing work, Lord? And would that work be by your Holy Spirit? God, you're not done with us. You're doing new work. You're creating new life, even today, God. As we continue to live into the life, love, and justice of Jesus, May we experience this new life by your spirit, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.